Today is July 13th, 2020, and my guest is author Matt Ridley. His latest book and the subject of today's discussion is How Innovation Works. This is Matt's fourth appearance on Econ Talk. He was last here in February 2016 talking about his book, The Evolution of Everything. I want to remind listeners there's a video of this episode available on YouTube. You can go there, search Econ Talk. You can subscribe. You can watch as well as listen. Matt, welcome back to Econ Talk. Russ, it's really nice to be back on Econ Talk, one of my uh, favorite shows. Thank you, sir. Uh, This book, your latest, uh, is the rare book that gets better as it goes along. It's really almost two books. It's In the first half, it's a a catalog of the complexity of innovation, some of its history and some very important areas. And the second half, which is fascinating, and we'll, we'll of course, be drawing on that, but the second half are the insights that you uh, come to having done that catalog in the first half. Uh, And I learned a great deal from the book. It's very provocative. Uh, it's just it's just fantastic. I want to start with a question, the difference between invention and innovation. I think a lot of people use those words interchangeably, but uh, there's an important distinction there. What is it? Yes. And the way I distinguish the two words is that uh, when a new device is invented, it also has to be made uh, available, affordable and reliable. And that process is innovation. And it's often much harder work than the original invention. Coming up with the first prototype is sometimes the easy bit. Turning it into something that people want and people can afford and that people can get hold of uh, is really tough work. There's a lovely story that Charles Towns, the inventor of the laser, used to tell, which rather nicely illustrates the difference between invention and innovation. He said, there's a beaver and a, and a rabbit looking at the Hoover Dam. And the beaver says to the rabbit, no, uh, I didn't build it, but it is based on an idea of mine. <laughs> <laughs> I love that story. It's, so, it's quite profound, actually. It's funny, but it's yes. quite profound. Yeah, I think a lot, of, um, a lot of people come up with good ideas and then they they claim that people stole them, uh, forgetting, as you yes. point out, in many cases, the genesis of an idea spontaneously is in many people's heads at once. And that's often not the hard part. The hard part is the practical Correct. side. And, and the great innovators were people who realized the importance of the downstream innovation process. So Thomas Edison is the classic example of this. He's one of 21 different people who invented the light bulb, but, but you he's said the 20, only one. You said 21. You said 21. it quickly. I want to emphasize yeah. that because I wouldn't have known that before I read your book. 21. Yeah. Go ahead. 21 different people deserve credit for independently coming up with the light bulb around the same time. It was kind of inevitable. It was kind of inexorable. The, the, te- the, the technologies you need to combine to make a light bulb were, all, were, were, were ripe. They were ready to go. And so Lodigan in Russia and um, Swan in England and various other people basically had roughly the same idea at the same time. And very little snooping as far as we can tell in this case. Some of these cases of simultaneous invention, which are very common, by the way, Some of these cases are based on people snooping on each other's work. But the difference was that Edison realized that in order to make light bulbs reliable, make them last for a long time without going fut, um, he needed to do a lot of hard work and he needed to do a lot of trial and error. So he put in a huge number of hours or got his assistants to put in a huge number of hours testing different materials, 5,000 different plant materials were tried uh, in the Edison factory um, to till they came up with a particular kind of Japanese bamboo that made a beautiful filament that worked really well. Um, that's the kind of thing that Edison meant when he, when he said that invention, but actually he meant innovation, that word yeah. wasn't around then, innovation is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. Which is another great line. And you also point out he sometimes said 2% innovation, 2% That's invention, right. 98%. I like, I like that <laughs> clarification of the historical record because uh, somebody might have, in, in today's world, might have said, oh, well, I saw 2%. So Ridley was off by 100% in his, S- yeah. in his quote. But I, I'm glad you showed there's, there, there's some variety there. Um, so that highlights two things that I think shine through in the in the first part of the book that are uh, incredibly important. One is, is that there are a lot of people working on most of the great 
inventions of our time to turn them into innovations. It's a slowish process that is highly trial and error oriented. Those are two, I'd say, key takeaway facts, stylized facts about innovation that that you highlight. Uh, and the third one I want to highlight, I want to mention, you can talk, you can add to that if you'd like, but the third is that so many of the great innovations of, of history were not done by scientists. They were done by practical people trying to solve a problem that they were grappling with, that they solved via trial and error, not, not a formal theoretical model, and that there were a lot of people doing it at the same time. And because of that, they often built on each other's gradual improvements to get to the stage of the, of the uh, technology that we become familiar with through, through history. And I think, so talk about that. It's a, that that's an incredibly yeah. nice stylized story of, of yeah. innovation generally. Well, the, there's a rather nice French word, Bricolage, which which means trial and error, means uh, tinkering, uh, really, and tinkering is a is a good description of what a lot of innovators do. They take a thing and they just keep trying different versions of it till they make it a little better, and above all, they they uh, add in the insights of lots of different people. So, for example, the Wright brothers, um, Orville and Wilbur Wright, um, they were absolutely insistent on writing to everybody they could find across the world, even in Australia, who had done experiments with gliders and other pre-flight things, to just to glean as much information as they can. They realized that, that, that innovation is not a matter of going and sitting in a darkened room with a wet towel around your head because you're such a genius, you're going to come up with the answer yourself. Uh, it's a matter of combining lots of, of people's ideas. And the contrast with Samuel Langley, who got a huge grant from the U.S. government to build a powered plane around the same time and uh, uh, refused to tell anyone his plans, did the whole thing in secret, uh, and then unveiled it in front of a crowd in Washington, D.C., and it crashed into the Potomac within 20 yards um, 10 days before the Wright brothers did it the right way on, in North Carolina. The contrast is very striking. And as that example shows... The world is often very reluctant to believe that a couple of bicycle mechanics can have done something that a brilliant astronomer who's head of the Smithsonian Institution has failed at, uh, which Samuel Langley was. And you get the same thing in the UK. You get um, Humphrey Davery and George Stevenson both invent the miner's lamp, but George Stevenson is an illiterate uh, mechanic and Humphrey Davy is the president of the Royal Institution. So no one wants to believe that the better lamp has been invented by the, the journeyman. So one of the things I want to do in this book is not to denigrate scientists because they do have great achievements and they right. are key to this whole process, um, but to rescue the reputation of the ordinary tinkering people, the bicycle mechanics from Dayton, Ohio, if you like, uh, and what they can achieve. Because quite often you find that they achieve a huge amount and then they go back to the scientists to explain what it is they're doing. So Thomas Newcomen, as far as we can tell, who invented the steam engine right at the start of the Industrial Revolution, incredibly important discovery, the first use of heat to do work, basically. Um, as far as we can tell, he's just a, a blacksmith, an engineer. He may not even have been literate. Um, we've got no portrait of him. We don't know, you know very much about his life. But he invented this tremendous machine. Uh, and as a result, the science of thermodynamics was born. It's effectively the scientists had to catch up with what the engineers were doing. Yeah, there's a lot there. I, first, I want to observe that tinkering is a, has a slightly pejorative tone to it. Um, yeah. it. It sounds like fooling around or just modifying things at the edges when, in fact, it's the key to the not so much the scientific method, but the discovery method that's at the heart of innovation. The other thought that comes to mind here and, and when I was reading your book is that um, – if you had asked me who invented the steam engine, I would have said Watt. Uh, Thomas Newcomen, who I, whose name I had heard before, but I couldn't have brought up from memory until I read your book. I'm going to try to remember it again out of in his honor. Uh, he doesn't get much glory. Uh, a lot of the people who either contributed to these processes or who simultaneously created them get no glory. The, you know, an obvious example, and it might be more familiar to some listeners, is Leibniz. Um, relative to Newton in inventing calculus. 
yep. uh, or Alfred Wallace uh, with with uh, natural selection and relative to Darwin. We understand the person who gets there first gets a little more of the glory, but this isn't just about that. This is about this whole underlying process. So tell us why we honor these singular people when in fact it really isn't the right way to be thinking about it. Well, we have a tendency to tell stories about brilliant individuals and put them on a pedestal. And we do this in every walk of life. I mean, after all, we expect New Hampshire to discover a godlike figure to run America for four years, every four years. Uh, <laughs> no, it's Iowa, but that just portrays your yeah, it's yeah, Iowa sorry. and New Hampshire. But that's okay. I knew what you meant. <laughs> Iowa's just a caucus. New Hampshire is a, is a, is a Good primary. Point. Good point. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, um, uh, where have I got to? Yes. Uh, so um, the great man theory of history that, that you know, Napoleon changes the world, um, whereas versus the idea that Napoleon is a product of the French Revolution, as it were, uh, is, is one way of thinking about this, that actually um, if Thomas Edison had been run over by a tram before he'd invented the light bulb, we would still have light bulbs. There were so many other people coming up with him, uh, up with the idea. If Sergey Brin had never met Larry Page, uh, we wouldn't call it Google, but we would still have search engines. Sure. And whoever got the most successful search engine would still be a billionaire. Uh, and so, it, you know, if you if you look at the computer industry over the last fifty years. This industry has an extraordinary inevitability about it, which is expressed in Moore's law, this marching forward of the efficiency and the cost of computers. Um, and yet it produces these billionaires who make huge fortunes out of doing these inevitable things that were going to be done anyway, which I find an interesting paradox to think about. So to some extent, we are making the mistake of giving too much credit and too much reward um, to uh, individuals. And we're singling people out from, from teams and mixtures of people. I mean, I have a section in the book called Who Invented the Computer? Uh, and I draw very heavily on Walter Isaacson's wonderful book, The Innovators, to, to understand that story. Uh, and in the end, I conclude that even though this happened only a couple of generations ago and everything was written down and everybody knew what everybody was doing, so it's not one of these things that's lost in the mists of time in the early 18th century like the steam engine, we can't say who invented the computer. There is no answer to that question. The first computer, um, if it was the ENIAC in Philadelphia, well, the ENIAC didn't have stored programs. Well, if it was the Mark I in in Harvard, well, that didn't have electronics. It was a mechanical device, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So you can see how um, uh, it, it, it's, it's a much more collective and much more distributed phenomenon, innovation, than we generally give it credit for. Yeah, I, I, we do have, we like romance. And <clears throat> I think the picking yeah. of the great inventor, um, the great mind, the great whatever appeals to our sense of, of romance there. I'm not quite yeah, and, sure why. I should just add that, that the first half of my book is stories about people. And I single out these people and I tell their stories. But I do so partly in order to say that although these people achieved incredible things, they invented the steam engine or vaccines or whatever it might be, um, uh, they did so as part of a process and part of a team and part of a group. Um, they didn't, uh, they weren't gods. And I think this is quite an important lesson to teach young people, particularly today, because there's a tendency to say, you know, Marconi or Morse or Watt or um, someone like that was unbelievably brilliant, or even Steve Jobs was unbelievably clever and could see far further into the future than anyone else. And that just ain't true. I mean, sometimes these were just people who worked a bit harder. They yeah. put in more hours or they did more experiments. Um, they weren't particularly brilliant. They just were prepared to 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 be open minded, to fail often and fast, and learn from failure. All these kind of things. You know, Jeff Bezos actually says this very clearly, and I quote him in in the book in a couple of places yeah. where where he says, you know, what I've achieved is just by failing a lot and learning from those failures and trying things and swinging and occasionally hitting. Um, you know, the story of Amazon is a st story of a string of failures. They went into the wrong businesses. Yeah. They did things wrong. They did it badly. Lost a lot of money. 
<laughs> lost a lot of money. And then in the end, they made a lot of money. You can argue that um, Jeff Bezos' biggest innovation is creating a company that tries lots of different things and fails and picks the good ones. Now, picking the good ones is not always easy. There's an art to that, obviously, but there's also serendipity and luck. Um, Correct. And I actually, I once asked Jeff, how do you, now you're a big company, how do you keep it uh, innovative? Because most big companies stop being innovative when they get big. Um, uh, and he, he gave me a very interesting example of the, the kinds of things they do at Amazon to, to solve that problem, um, which is that normally if uh, somebody junior in the organization has a bright new idea, you know, what we should do is, I don't know, sell um, dog food or something. Um, he comes to a management committee, makes a proposal, and the management committee kind of three quarters of them say it's a bad idea and one quarter say it's a good idea and the idea is turned down. And um, the problem with that is that the, the 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 higher up in the organization are you are, the less you're going to hear about the maverick ideas from the bottom. Yeah. So he operates a reverse veto system. If one person on that committee still thinks it's a good idea and all the others think it's a terrible idea, then it has to be sent up to the next level of management um, to insight. be considered. It's quite a nice concept. So I want to come back to your um, what you said about Steve Jobs. I want to do it through a um, interesting list I saw from uh, Gorin Branwin. Gorin Branwin has a website Gorin, at gorin.net, and he has an essay there called My Ordinary Life, Improvements Since the 1990s. And I love this list. Uh, it's a ver it's a list of innovations, some of which are obvious and dramatic. Some of them are not so noticeable, and I've added uh, a few of my own. So just a few examples. Uh, he says uh, uh, streaming video, huge, obviously. The death of, of VHS and tapes. That meant no trips to Blockbuster, enormous expansion of choice uh, from both the archive of past work and new material. You know, I like to say we live in the golden age of storytelling through video. It's incredible. No rewinding is one of the things he emphasizes. You have to rewind Absolutely. the tapes. Uh, the death of phone tag. You don't have to constantly go back and forth trying to reach someone. Uh, texting has allowed that to happen and sharing calendars. Uh, hearing aids are smaller and cheaper. Uh, GPS, the fact that it, you don't get lost anymore is extraordinary. Uh, search, obviously. Smartphones, obviously, I would point in particular to the photography revolution that search phones have allowed and soon will be the death of cameras, I think, in, in very short order. Uh, he gives example of power tools that are more reach, that are often rechargeable. You don't have to constantly be finding the right size of uh, batteries. Uh, cars, is my Just list. on that, on that one, oh. have, <laughs> when did you last have to replace a battery in anything? I mean, I did uh, on a on a portable razor the other day, yeah, but I haven't done so for a year or it's so. Lovely. Whereas you used it, to spend the whole time. <laughs> uh, cars have rear view cameras. They're keyless. Movie theaters, ticketing is simpler. The seats are better. LASIK surgery is safe and inexpensive. Board games. We're not stuck with Monopoly, which I think is a lousy game, but rather you get Puerto Rico and Settlers of Catan. Uh, obviously, we have uh, massive multiplayer online role-playing games that we talked about with Josh Williams last week. Here's one from, um, from Gorn. Self-adhesive postage stamps. <laughs> nice. It's pleasant. The explosion of craft beer, high quality beer and coffee. And this one's a fabulous one. Better apples. The honey crisp just so dominates the red delicious. And this is the one. I love this. Brussels sprouts are less bitter. Who knew? Uh, and he doesn't mention that wireless. Right? That's that, what I he should says. Try them. I should he try says, them because yeah. I... I avoid them like the plague because they I love taste them. bitter to me. I don't mind that when they were a little better, they're better. Uh, and he doesn't mention wireless earbuds, but they're like, to me, a game changer in, in just walking around and, and living. What about the seedless life. grape? Uh, huge. Seedless watermelon. So many good things. But I want to suggest, and some of these, is, you know, you're laughing, some of these are silly, but many of them are momentous. And I want to suggest that you could make the case that Steve Jobs is somewhat in a class by himself uh, as a revolutionary in terms of how we change the way we consume music, the role that the internet plays in our lives because we can put it in our pocket and it, 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 the laptop, he transformed it. Is there anyone who's put more of a stamp on our weirdly, radically different daily lives than Steve Jobs? 
I think you're right. And I think he stands out in several ways, partly because uh, the, 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 the model of Apple was a, was a develop things in-house. It wasn't an open source model. The rest of the computing world is moving towards open source and always yeah. has been. But this was kind of going in a different direction. Um, and partly because of this fake it till you make it philosophy that he adopted, where he would announce things that he wasn't yet ready to produce, which is a risky option. And which, by the way, his his disciple, or rather, sorry, the person who was trying to model herself on him, Elizabeth Holmes, tried with Theranos, um, yeah. Theranos and it didn't didn't work. Uh, and the reason he was able to get away with it was because Moore's law kept delivering. I mean, the great thing about transistors was the smaller you made them, the the cheaper they got, and the more reliable they got. You know, whereas everything else gets less reliable to make the smaller you make it. Um, so he was able to deliver on these extraordinary uh, promises. There's a very nice uh, novel by Robert Harris. Uh, very recent novel uh, called The Second Sleep, which came out about a year ago, um, in which he, um, uh, I, I don't want to give the plot away too much, but it's its its set in, in the distant future in a, a very primitive time when we've lost most technologies. And um, one of the things they're trying to figure out is why so many of the devices that belong to the ancients had a half-bitten apple drawn on them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's a great... That's a that's a great way to put his influence. Uh, I was going to say something akin to what I said about Jeff Bezos. You know, you, we, both of us, I think, in the last three minutes, used Steve Steve Jobs as a uh, with verbs and then nouns as if he was the creator. But of course, he wasn't. He wasn't the inventor of, of any, almost any of these things. He was not the innovator. Uh, he he was the uh, package coach. He was what'd you call him? Packager. I mean, he the packages. Package, but more than that, you know, he was the. That. I agree. He's the coach. He's the inspirer. He's the muse, and he got people to do things for him. And you said fake it till the, till you make it. He got people to make stuff for him that that weren't possible. <laughs> yeah. But they did it because of his char charisma. You know, this the, the Walter Isaacson biography. I, I happened to pick it up last night after you know reading your book. And I was looking through it. He talks about when he launched uh, the first Macintosh in 1984. The code wasn't ready. It was a week before they had announced the launch. And the team came to him and said, you know, it's, it's, we're really sorry. We're working like crazy. And it's going to take us three weeks, not one week. So what, what we'll do is we'll ship it with a demo software. And then we'll ship the, the real software two weeks after that. And he said... You know, you guys, you're so talented. I know you can do it in a week. And he walked away. And they did it. They did it. <laughs> they did right. something they didn't think they were capable of. And the, the, his, the Isaacson book is filled with those kind of stories where, you know, he's a visionary, obviously. But I think um, akin to Bezos, he created a innovation factory. Not a factory of the 19th, late 19th century, but a place where minds work together, crowdsourcing and creating and testing and failing. And that's his gift. That was his gift, literally. I can, I agree with that. And I think um, Jobs, Bezos and Edison have this one thing in common, which is that they spotted that innovation itself could be a yeah. product. Well said. You could, you could have a place that, you know, whose job was to generate innovations. Uh, you know, Edison, Edison was sort of trying all sorts of things. You know, well, give me a give me a common or garden device that's in use, and I'll I'll try and find you an innovative version of it. Um, you know, it, he really it, that was the theme of everything he did. Um, one of the interesting issues that I grapple with in my book is why this works in some fields and not others. It's obviously worked incredibly well in electronics in the last yeah. generation. Um, it's not worked as well in vaccines as we're discovering this year. Yeah. Uh, it's not worked nearly as well in transport, which ground to a halt uh, about 50 years ago in terms of improvements in speed, at least. I mean, yep. sure, uh, airplanes are more uh, less likely to crash um, and have better movies on them, but they don't go any faster than they did in the 1960s. In fact, we still fly 747s, which entered service in 1969. Imagine using a computer that entered right. service in 1969. Um, 
so sometimes you come up against physical limits that make it very difficult, or sometimes you come up against regulatory obstacles. The reason nuclear has been unable to innovate in the last generation uh, is because every new design must go through such an enormously expensive and time-consuming uh, regulatory approval process um, that nobody tries anything new because if it doesn't work, you're a billion dollars out of pocket, yeah. which nobody wants to be. I want to go back to the Wright brothers for a second. Um, two things there. One is a wonderful quote in the book. Uh, you talk about a, a, a remark that a photographer made in describing the Wright brothers. He called them, quote, the workingest boys I ever knew. The workingest yes. boys I ever knew. I think that's just the greatest. Uh, Isn't that a lovely quote? Yeah. I was just thrilled when I came across and that, that quote. And that they just worked like crazy. They didn't have lives. Yeah. They, they had yeah. no family other than their, their, them, each other. They weren't married. Their sister. No their, children. Their sister was a, was a crew. And funnily enough, their sister was the only graduate in the family. She went to university. They didn't, um, interestingly. And that, um, that they but, just and they, kept trying. And, and I read... I don't think this is in your book, but I read on, on Wikipedia that uh, in, uh, I think it was 2003, the 100th anniversary of the flight at Kitty Hawk, they tried to recreate it. And it couldn't be done because they had so much knowledge, particular knowledge of how Tacit that design, knowledge. yeah, of how that design worked, yes. that to get to that, you couldn't just steer it. You couldn't just take off. Right. It's really a beautiful right. uh, image. And there's also, by the way, there's a photograph we'll link to. Um, and it's a very famous photograph of the plane when it took off. It is such, it gives me goosebumps when uh, when I look at it and just mentioning it. Uh, it, it. It actually looks like it could be Photoshopped. It looks like maybe they weren't really off the ground. Hard to tell. And the, I assume it's, it's Wilbur is standing there uh, in silhouette watching it and there's something about his stance uh and the way he's standing yes. that's that's just incredibly moving to me as part of human creativity in a stiff collar yeah yeah uh, you talked about how they they they, they dress for church every day uh it sounds <laughs> like uh, but i also want to mention to take us to the next topic it's a segue here there's a book i love called orbiting the giant hairball which is an unusual title it's a book by the late gordon mckenzie who uh, I had the privilege of talking to a little bit. He, he is a wonderful man. And it's about his adventures in Hallmark, the greeting card company. Uh, he was in charge of creativity there and how bizarre that was. So the giant hairball is sort of the corporate mess uh, that, that stops creativity from happening. He has a chapter in that book that is one sentence long. And this is a sentence, could have been in your book, um, one of my favorite sentences. Orville Wright did not have a pilot's license. And there's two great <laughs> aspects to that. One is it shows the problems with licensing generally. But secondly, it's really about permissionless innovation. Talk about that. Right. Um, well, I think that's that's a, a terrific insight because uh, the, 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 the degree to which you have to get permission to go off and innovate in certain areas has become a real problem. As you say, it's either through occupational licensing uh, or through uh, government regulation, but also through patents. You know, you have to get permission yeah. from your competitors, essentially, to, to dive into certain areas. And one of, the, one of the interesting things that I'm intrigued by is how the Clinton administration in the late 1990s deliberately set out to pass some really astonishingly libertarian legislation through Congress um, that paved the way for e-commerce, um, that made online retail and online business possible for the first time. And these, these rules were essentially about it being permissionless. You didn't have to seek someone's permission before you set up an online business. Um, uh, and when you contrast that with what it's like if you want to go out and develop a new drug to sort to cure cancer or develop a new medical device to diagnose a disease or something like that, um, uh, the, the contrast is truly extraordinary. And that's why essentially, and Peter Thiel often makes this point, uh, today, we don't, you know, drug discovery is ground to a halt to some extent, whereas uh, the making of video games goes 
from strength to strength <laughs> because you don't need permission to develop a video game and you do need permission to develop a drug. Now, there are good reasons for that. I'm not saying it's, it's not uh, sensible to have regulation in terms of safety for drug development and so on. Um, but is it really necessary to take um, up to 40 months to give approval to a new medical device? No, it's not. The reason we know it's not is because during the COVID-19 pandemic of 2020, we shortened that period to a couple of weeks in many cases. And we gave new diagnostic devices, new ventilators, all these kind of things, uh, rapid approval. So um, rediscovering the virtues of permissionless innovation is, is, is I think, it, that phrase, by the way, was coined, I think, or at least I came across it in a, in a work by Adam Tira. I don't know how to pronounce yes. it, M T I H E A R. Yeah. Um, and uh, it, it, it does feel to me that this gets to the heart of why I have as a subtitle of my book and why innovation flourishes in freedom. Because I think uh, the, the one ingredient that is common to all the themes that came out from the stories I told in my book is that the innovator had to be free. He had to be free to fail and try again. He had to be free to change his mind and go in a different direction. He had to be free to, to try something without getting someone's permission. But the consumer also had to be free to express his preference, to say, yes, actually, yeah. I do want innovations in this area, but I'm not interested in them in another area. Um, uh, and this combination of completely unpredictable freedom expressed through permissionless innovation is, is, is absolutely vital. And this reminds me of one other point which I really like, which is that I mentioned earlier that the search engine was kind of inevitable in the 1990s. Once you've invented the internet, it's obvious you're going to invent the search engine. At least it's obvious in retrospect. But in prospect, was it obvious? No. Nobody, very few people predicted the importance of search in the 1980s. And when they did, they did so in a very vague way. Um, uh, and in fact, even the people who were inventing search engines, including Larry Page and Sergey Brin, didn't realize that's what they were doing. They were just thinking of ways of, cat of cataloging the internet. Um, uh, and in fact, they came up with, uh, well, I'll tell you what, the, the, what people were getting wrong. People thought we would go into the internet and wander around and see what we came across. Instead of which, we go into the internet looking for something, yeah. you know, looking for And then uh, we product. wander around. And then and, we wander around. <laughs> and then we wander around within a limited area. Yeah. Yes, we, well, we do wander around, around too. You're but it's interesting how the wandering around has become such an important part of it, uh, a testament to our wealth, I think, or the amount of leisure and our standard of living. But Correct. Uh, th th there's a paradox you just highlighted I, I just want to emphasize, which is – it's what I had in mind also when I mentioned Steve Jobs. Everything seems inevitable, but it seems like every once in a while someone like Steve Jobs comes along who, who makes something that only is inevitable in retrospect. Uh, I mean, the App Store, I didn't mention it, but that's a genius idea. Again, on the surface, all it is just a marketplace. It's just a place to buy and sell stuff. What's the innovation? Really amazing idea and, took, yeah. and, and a risky one because he lost control, obviously, to some extent of what goes on, his, on the product, the phone. But the, um, that paradox between, in retrospect, everything looks inevitable, but at the time we can't figure out what comes next is, is just, it's a little bit, um, it's mind bending. The other point I want to mention, uh, which I got out of your book, which was really not obvious to me, you talk about the freedom of both producer and consumer. Uh, you have a quote from William Petty, 18th century, maybe? Like, 17th I think, century, 17th. 1600s. So a long time ago. He had a tough life. A lot of his insights didn't come to fruition. Uh, there's a fantastic quote. I'm not going to read it at length. I'm not going to read it, but there's a quote in there of his frustration. He had all these great ideas, barrier after barrier he couldn't surmount, competitors, lots of troubles, tough time. And I thought of that long quote, and it's a, it's a litany of, of complaint, yes. uh, in light of, of a, a bromide uh, of... In, in 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 English, which is build a better mousetrap and the world will beat a path to your door. Yes. Which is a statement about consumer sovereignty, basically, and, and the power of markets. And yes. yet, a lot of times the consumer doesn't know they want a better mousetrap until it's there. And then it sometimes takes a long time. So I thought that that whole dynamism of frustration and the time to market, you know, you give the example of wheeled luggage. 
-hmm. Like, that was a good idea. What took so long? And the answer, as you point out, is it actually was here for a long time. People just Mm -hmm. didn't notice it. Was it marketed well? Or who knows? But that whole idea that, 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 oh, yeah, once you build a better thing, it's magic. Yeah. It's not. Yeah. No, the, the and this comes back to this difference between innovation and invention uh, is that that you know you cannot say here's my prototype I'm going to sit back <laughs> and back and let everybody uh, yeah. uh, uh, enjoy the product. You've got to get out there and uh, first of all explain to people that they might enjoy having your product, which isn't always obvious in, in some cases. Um, uh, and then you've got to make sure that it's reliable, that you know the, the instructions don't take too long to, yeah. to read or whatever. Uh, I mean, right at the beginning of the book, I, uh, I talk about sliced bread, you know, for the obvious reason that best thing since sliced bread, it became I a sort of that. cliche. I love that you did um, that. <laughs> and um, uh, it's it, it's it's a, a a guy a former optometrist in Chillicothe, uh, Missouri, who first made sliced bread. Why there? Nineteen twenties. Why then? Why there? Why him? You know, and there isn't a particularly good answer to any of those questions. Actually, I mean, he's German, and he's probably, you know, a techy kind of guy, and. Um, uh, and, you know, the heart of the country there has been surprisingly innovative. I mean, Ohio, you know, it produced a whole string of inventions from the aeroplane to the sewing machine in, in the decades before that. There was something weird about the Midwest at that point that, that, that you know, well, the way Silicon Valley is today, if you like. Um, but also this guy realized that it's no good inventing sliced bread unless you invent good packaging for bread yeah because if you slice bread and don't package it properly it's just going to dry out quicker right. <laughs> so That's um so he so he realizes you've got to invent the whole package quite literally in this case you know you, you don't just invent uh, one aspect of it you 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 package it in a way that works for people. And then you get cases like Google Glass, which is just a few years ago Google, Google came up with a device from their kind of skunk works, which they call Google X, which is where they, they come up with weird products. Um, they came up with this pair of spectacles that you put on and and you could basically see in the glass your emails or um or whatever it is you can see, I can't remember. In your field of vision. It can give you information about what you're looking. Yeah. It was a brilliant idea. Yeah. It's and it's, incredible. It, it's such a failure. Achievement. Yeah. It's such a failure that you have to describe what it is because there are people listening who've already <laughs> forgotten about it or didn't even know it happened because it dropped off the face of the earth. Right. And they 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 launched it and nobody wanted it. So they <laughs> withdrew it and said, Well, maybe we'll tweak it and relaunch it. And they tried that and it didn't work. And um turns out that Two and a half thousand dollars to be able to um, see things in your field of vision, like a fighter pilot can, while looking a bit geeky because you're wearing a weird pair <laughs> of specs, doesn't hit the spot for consumers. So, um, so there are cases where you you can you you can take the the, the consumer to water, but he doesn't want to drink. Yeah, uh, there's a great line in your book. Uh, I th- you could teach a whole class of economics around this line. I think you say the following. The chief way in which innovation changes our lives is by enabling people to work for each other. What did you mean by that? Well, I think this is the great theme of human history, that we've gone from being self-sufficient, where you go out and you plant your own crops and you eat them, uh, to where you spend your working day doing things that help other people, and in exchange, you get paid for it. Um, We get more and more specialized in the things we produce in order to become more and more diversified in the things that we consume. So compared with a self-sufficient peasant, as it were, uh, I can consume a far greater variety of things. I can, you know, movies, restaurant meals, whatever it might be. Um, But in order to achieve that, I have to produce one thing, in my case, a book, Um, (laughs) or in somebody else's case, you know, uh, accountancy or um, uh, you know, airline pilot services or whatever it might be. Um, Haircuts. A haircut, exactly. Um, so, um, and, and it's innovation that has been at the heart of making that journey towards interdependence possible um, or away from self-sufficiency. Um, uh, it, cause it's, it's, you know, this is back to Adam Smith's pin factory, you know, that by yes, making me more efficient at cutting hair, 
or writing books, whatever it is, um, it, it makes it then makes more sense for me to cut a lot of people's hair rather than just cut hair and plant my own crops. Because if I cut enough people's hair, then I can get enough money to go out and buy buy food. I don't need to plant my own crops, you know. So that whole process is is I, and here's a here's a really nice story which actually gets to the heart of how innovation works. Um, I I had that that way of expressing it that we get more and more uh, uh, specialized in our production so that we can get more and more diversified in our consumption. Uh, I got that from a book uh, called Second Nature by a guy called Haim Ofek, which was about um, uh, basically sort of, you know, Stone Age economics. And uh, I wrote to him and I said, um, this is such a nice idea. I really want to, you know, take it further and explore it. And have you done anything else on this? And da -da -da. this is a long time ago. And he wrote back and said, well, I think I got that idea from your book, The Origins of Virtue. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, uh -huh. I hadn't awesome. expressed it that way, but he had twisted what I'd said into a w way that I then twisted back into a way that I found useful, you know. That's so and that's, that's, that's the way innovation works. Yeah. In this case, innovation in ideas rather than devices, but it's the yeah. same. It's really, it's fantastic. I, my, my version of that is uh, self-sufficiency is the road to poverty. Right. Uh, you, you make the point that uh, mutual interdependence is safer. Uh, and of course, it's more interesting. The way you phrase it is modern people have a less varied job, but a much more varied life. So rather than uh, moving from crop to crop and repairing your house and uh, keeping the horses happy and whatever else was part of agricultural life, uh, now people tend to do one thing, less interesting doing one thing, but their scope for enjoying the fruits of that are, of course, much larger. And as you point out, it's a great statistic. It's, of course, not true. Sorry, but it's approximately true. Uh, and it's sort of true on average, which is, I think you said in 1900, uh, average people, maybe it was America, I can't remember, I think somewhere maybe in the Western world, spent about 25% of their life at work. Yep. That number's down to 10% because of longer retirement, longer life, longer life expectancy, more education, uh, shorter work week, the yep. two-day weekend. Uh, and that doesn't include, as you point out, uh, lunch on the job, but it also doesn't account for the uh, use of the internet on the job, which I always like to point out that people are able, many people are able to do in, yes. in their so-called full-time job. Uh, there's a lot of leisure in the full-time job, even though it's less varied. Correct. So I think that that transformation away from a richer work life to a richer non-work life is really a powerful way of thinking about maternity. Yes, uh, I, I, I think that's right. And it'll, it'll be interesting to see how far it goes because this gets to the question of whether um, robots can replace human work. Uh, you know, if, if we got to the point where robots could do everything and all you need to do is, uh, you know, the, your work consisted of, flicking a switch at the beginning of a day to, to, to tell the robots to, to fulfill all your needs. Um, uh, people think that's a horrifying concept, but actually where's the problem? You know, I mean, well, it's hard to know. You, <laughs> it, it, a lot um, of people get meaning from work. So it's, it's, they it's do. tricky. Yeah, no, I can, I can see that. And, and I understand that, but, um, but I think it's vanishingly unlikely we will get there because the more, uh, over every generation has said, oh my God, this automation, this technology is going to throw people out of work. In fact, what it's done is enabled us, as you just said a moment ago, to work a smaller proportion of our lives, which is sharing out the leisure that automation gives us. Yeah, And you can always think of something, you know, whether it's having your pet groomed or whatever it might be, uh, that, that uh, you now would like done for you. Yeah. Um, that you couldn't imagine wanting to have done for you when you were an 18th century peasant. So I'm going to read a long quote um, from the book about freedom. And I want to turn to that. Um, you say, innovation is the child of freedom because it is a free creative attempt to satisfy freely expressed human desires. Innovative societies are free societies where people are free to express their wishes 
seek the satisfaction of those wishes, and where creative minds are free to experiment to find ways to supply those requests so long as they do not harm others. I do not mean freedom in some extreme libertarian lawless sense, just the general idea that if something has not been specifically prohibited, then the assumption should be made that it must be allowed, a surprisingly rare phenomenon today in a world where governments try to dictate what you can do as well as what you cannot. And I'm just going to continue because I think this is just the important consequence of that observation. This is again a quote. This reliance on freedom explains why innovation cannot easily be planned because neither human wishes nor the means of their satisfaction are easy to anticipate in the detail required. Why innovation nonetheless seems inevitable in retrospect because the link between desire and satisfaction is only then manifest. Why innovation is a collective and collaborative business because one mind knows too little about other minds. Why innovation is organic because it must be a response to an authentic and free desire, not what somebody in authority thinks we should want. Why nobody really knows how to cause innovation because no one can make people want something. And I just think that's just a, that's a great summary of what, of what your book's about. I just, one more line, you say, innovation is the child of freedom and the parent of prosperity. It's a beautiful line. Right. Well, we, you know, we would not be able to live prosperous lives and have such low uh, child mortality and uh, long lifespans and things if it weren't for innovations. Innovations like vaccination, you know, which is um, yeah. a beautiful example of a technology that has unbelievably large upsides and extremely small downsides, despite you know the uh, worries of many yeah. people, uh, as we are being reminded at the moment. Um, uh, and by the way, which has never made anybody a fortune, as far as I can make out. I can't think, I, I talk in the book about, you know, the slave who brought uh, vaccination to America, a guy called Onesimus, who was working for the preacher Cotton Mather in, in uh, Boston, and who said, look, you know, I know the smallpox in Boston at the moment, back where I came from in West Africa, we used to give a little dose of smallpox to kids from people who'd survived, and that tended to protect them for their lives. You might want to try it. And um, Mather approaches a bunch of doctors, and 13 of them said, don't be ridiculous, it's the most dangerous idea I've ever heard. Um, and the 14th, Zabdiel Boylston, says, I'll give it a go. And he vaccinates, inoculates is the word, the, word, the right. right word to use in that context, um, 300 people, and they all survived the, the Boston uh, smallpox pandemic. But Boylston is hounded out of town is forced to go into hiding because he's done something so unpopular. So um, uh, and then, then there are these two wonderful women who invented the, the whooping cough vaccine very quickly in the 1930s and never put a foot wrong and never made a penny out of it either. Um, they, um, uh, you know, they, they were just very public spirited people. So the idea that, um, um, uh, I'm going to have to just tell my dog to stop making so much noise. Doesn't bother. I can barely hear it. So go ahead. We'll really? edit this out. Good. Yeah, okay. keep going. Good. <laughs> so go back to so, the two women and keep your train of thought going. Repeat that yes, part. Yes, exactly. Well, um, uh, Grace Eldering and Pearl Kendrick. Or was it the other way around? Pearl Eldering and Grace Kendrick. Anyway, well, <laughs> that was their names. And they uh, they set out really in their spare time to develop a whooping cough vaccine. In four short years, they did it with the help of Eleanor Roosevelt, who championed their cause. But they then gave it away freely to anyone who wanted it. It basically got rid of whooping cough in America and then the world. It's now a very rare disease. It was one of the biggest killers of all in the 1920s. Um, so, uh, you know... These innovations are fantastically important for giving us uh, a better life. The part I particularly liked about the vaccination stories uh, was that, you know, we didn't know anything about antibodies. We didn't know anything about how the human immune right. system worked. People had this idea of giving people the disease. It's a horrible idea. It's a really yeah. bad idea. But some people <laughs> had seen it work. I, I forget how it got the first person who tried it 
uh, it's not really the thing you'd think of uh, first as a technique. Well, we don't know. We we know that that, that 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 it got to Britain from Constantinople, where it was being practiced in the Ottoman court. But there was a rumor that it had come from China or Africa. And as I say, this an African brought it to America, direct from Africa. So somewhere out in the world, someone had figured this out. But as you say, it was centuries. It was Pasteur before we begin to understand how it works. And even right. then, we don't really understand it. And well, even today, I would argue... <laughs> We don't fully understand so well. it. Uh, you yeah. know, the, the immunologists are very clever people, but I sometimes think when I'm listening to them that they are they haven't quite figured it all out yet. You know, they suddenly start saying, well, yes, but T cells are important as well as B cells, you know, and you think, right, well, which? <laughs> well, it reminds me of the um, story you tell about uh, birds, that birds have different nests depending on their species, but every bird around the world of a particular species makes a certain kind of nest. Yes. So they're, they've innovated this technique for incubating their eggs. And the part that's so weird about it is that, we, uh, how is that possible? And, and the answer, because they don't have a manual that they right. show their kids. Um, they don't have the internet. So they're kind of handicapped. And we have a phrase to describe, to explain it. We say, well, it's innate. Yeah. To me, that's just a way of saying we don't have any idea how it works. Uh, right. You know, I, I, it's just, it's a right. Yeah, because, I mean, if, if, if there was only one way of making a nest and all birds had it, then you would understand it. But, you know, right now in my garage, there's a swallow which has five babies in its nest. That nest is made entirely of mud. Now, yesterday I happened when I was taking my dog for a walk to stumble upon a, a reed bunting's nest, which is made entirely of grass. Now, you know, that's always the case. All reed buntings build their nests of grass. All swallows build their nests of mud. Um, uh, how on earth do you set up a brain to do that? And by the way, does that explain why we human beings had a million years of technology before we had anything that seems to resemble innovation? We had these stone tools that did not show any sign of changing for right. thousands of generations. Um so maybe they were expressions of instinct in the same way that um, a bird's nest is an expression of its instinct. Uh, we're going to digress here for a minute because I thought this was just so incredibly interesting. Uh, you talk about the dog as an innovation. There's a, there's a section of the book. Part of this book is about technology and the vaccines and light bulbs and, and standard things we think of as innovation. But it also has some things that are we sometimes forget are, in, are innovative, such as uh, putting a curve in the uh, piping of a toilet to keep yep. the odors out. Huge innovation, really simple. <laughs> but the domestication of animals uh, and the transformation of a wolf into a more docile uh, creature and then a wide array of, of variations on that uh, is an extraordinary innovation. But the part that was really mind-blowing is you talk about the idea that maybe humans did this to themselves as well. We domesticated ourselves, we looked for mates, partners, or partners evolved more effectively when they were more docile, could communicate with strangers, could uh, trust strangers. This whole idea that that we look different and we have smaller brains than some of our yes. ancestors in the same way that dogs have smaller brains than wolves. Yes. That's, um, can you want to talk about that? That I, I, utterly fascinating. Yeah, well, um, um, uh, this is, uh, you know, the, the, one of the ideas about human development over the last uh, tens of thousands of years is that, that it has been a process of self-domestication. But it, it, in some way, we had to weed out the people who just lashed out and killed people. Um, like, and, as you suggest, I mean, ape species can't, they can't board a bus peacefully because right. they're going to kill each other. <laughs> exactly. I mean, you know, you, you're boarding a plane and the guy behind you bumps the back of your knee with his suitcase. You might feel slight irritation, but you don't turn around and kill him, which yeah. is what uh, a chimpanzee would do. Uh, you know, it is a stranger you know, from another tribe and he's just physically assaulted me. I mean, you know, we have to attack. So uh, human beings are way lower in reactive aggression than other um, uh, species. This is, this is an argument made very nicely uh, in a recent book by Richard Wrangham, and I'm struggling to remember its name, the name of the book, but anyway, it's a very good book. We'll find it and link to it. Yeah, Carry on. That, please. Um, and uh, whereas we're 
were were worse than other species in terms of planned aggression, you know, um, cold blood aggression, you know, going out there and deliberately starting a war or murdering someone. We're pretty big, we're pretty good at that. But in terms of the sort of uh, reacting violently, um, uh, we we've somehow tamped that down. Now, the only way we could have done that is by ostracizing or killing the people who did that too much. Yeah. So that generation after generation, we somehow uh, rewarded the, the the karma people and um, got rid of the uh, more ridiculously angry and violent people. Um, uh, and we don't know exactly how we did that, but one of the effects that that would have had would be to slow down the development of the last part of the brain. The, the, the brain goes through a sort of developmental phase sort of from the bottom to the top. And uh, one of the last things it does, it has a whole bunch of cells that migrate to something called the neural crest, which gives you the sort of angry alpha male end of your brain. That's a terribly oversimplified way of saying what's going on. Um, uh, and uh, in doing so, uh, we we therefore just slowed down the development of a brain a bit, and as a result, we got slightly smaller brains, as well as having slightly more childlike faces, um, uh, uh, more interest in play. You know, we're, we're, we're like dogs; we're just a bit frozen in youth as um, uh, animals. We don't really fully mature into the big, smelly, cross, aggressive, <laughs> hairy. Okay, we do a bit. <laughs> yeah, well, well, but but it's less than you might expect. I think that's exactly. the punchline, and that's what's interesting about it. We're all, uh, yeah, uh, it's just a fascinating idea, unknowable if it's true, but I, I like to think about it. Well, uh, it's, I, it's it's probably twenty or thirty thousand years back, so we're never going to get good evidence. Right. But it, um, Correct. Well, when we get those time machines, which uh, you well, know, wouldn't that be if, wonderful? Yeah, if Steve Jobs had lived longer, I'm sure he would have invented one because we'd like to have one. <laughs> um, more seriously, I, I, I want to close with a topic that I, I don't think you talked about in the book. That that I think about a lot. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna put this sort of in the in a negative way to start with. I, the book's in praise of innovation to a large almost totally. You can see there's some innovations that have dark sides, obviously, but in general, innovation leads to prosperity, and one could argue that you know. Taking a negative view of innovation, that it's just a bunch of gadgets, at least in the in the modern era. You know, the, the cell phone is actually as, as remarkable a device as it is. And we had Rodney Brooks on the program talk about in an essay he wrote, where I, which I love, where he suggests he imagines uh, Newton uh, traveling forward in time and, and you hand him a cell phone. And here's the person who totally began our understanding of color and how it works. And he sees the screen of the cell phone with all the apps lit up and it, it would just blow him away. And he'd have no, he could, you could actually show him the Principia, his, his great work online yeah. with his handwritten yeah. annotations that right. we have that would just, I don't know, it would, his head would explode. Yeah. Uh, forget showing him a YouTube video on how to make um, uh, sourdough bread, which he would probably find interesting as well. But he'd have no idea how it works, none at all. And, and that this, I mean, so there's an enormous temptation to romanticize this. It, on the flip side, well, let's be honest, it really doesn't make us that much happier. Um, in fact, it may lead to some dysfunctional behavior we're going to struggle to deal with. Uh, so, so there's, to make the case against innovation, you, mm. you could do it. You, you didn't, but, but one could. And I, yeah. I want to suggest that there's an upside of innovation that stands beyond all that which is just the human enterprise of it, the opportunity to express ourselves, to do what Steve Jobs called put a dent in the universe. And whether he actually did or whether it was inevitable doesn't matter. Uh, the novelty, the dynamism of innovation, the ability to work on something that's never been done before, the ability to make something better that, than what it is now, it just seems like it's a fundamental part of humanity that goes beyond the prosperity standard of living part. You want to comment on that? 
Yeah, I think I think you're dead right. That even if it's not making us happy, it's worth it somehow because happiness isn't everything. Yeah. Um, and you know, you're absolutely right. I was you too utopian uh, about the internet and social media. Twenty years ago, I thought this internet world was going to enable us to um, understand each other's views of points of view. <laughs> Oh, actually, I think you need maybe French horns. I think at that point, and, and with the violins. Sorry, go ahead. Right, and look, look what social media has done to our society. You know, whether it's done it alone or would have done it anyway or whatever. You know, I don't know, but but rather like printing had a big impact. It set off religious wars. Uh, radio helped the rise of the dictators. Um, so I think social media has created populism and anger and yeah. uh, I did I don't. Uh, identity politics and uh, the cancel culture. It's not. It's not the happy world I thought it was going to be. Twenty where years. Where are those? Ago. Where are those unicorns? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but would I trade it for you know per, a perpetual version of the nineteen fifties? Uh, of course not. You know, I mean, there's just so much more we know about the world, so much more we can do, so much more we can think um, now uh, than we than any generation in the past. That I feel that that is worth it, Um, uh, uh, and that somewhere deep in the human psyche uh, is an interest in knowing what's around the corner, even if what's around the corner is a pretty angry bear. Yeah, I. I want to come back to the Orville Wilbur Wright photograph. Uh, I, I, ha- I, love, I love plane travel. And I'm, I find part of what I find hard about the pandemic we're in the middle of is that that's off the table. Um, I can't see my family the way I would otherwise be able to. I can't give talks that I had planned. Um, and you could argue that the airplane and the car, which were – Clearly, the two together, the, you could argue with the transformative technologies of the 20th century, that they were terrible for humanity. They, they pushed us apart. They left. They destroyed the small town. Uh, they killed family life. They allowed family members to move far away and not see each other, which meant children were raised. You, know, you, can make, you could tell that story. And then you look at that photograph. And, and you know, one of the things that's great about it is that uh, whoever's not in the plane, I, Again, I think it's Wilbur. You can't see his face. His back is to us. You see his right. profile silhouette. Can you imagine what that front of what he would look like head on? We can. <laughs> we have yeah. some idea of that incredible magic. You, you talk about the space launch, visiting the moon. Not much practical about it. Doesn't matter. It's a glorious it, human achievement. It's- yeah, I mean, I can remember. I think for some reason I was woken in the middle of the night for the. Apollo 11 moon landing. I can't remember what time of day it happened, but, you know, I was nine years old. My parents didn't want me to, yeah. to miss it. 11 years old, sorry. My parents didn't want me to miss it. And um, uh, and all I, I, I couldn't understand why these people kept saying the word Houston. I didn't know what Houston was. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, you know, a grainy image. And it, uh, I'm just so thrilled I was alive at that moment. And, yeah, yeah I've been furious that my parents had let me sleep through that. Um, so... Yeah, um, it, 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 this is an incredible planet and uh, it is an incredible world. And somewhere, you know, somewhere in the next 50 years, some, something equally momentous is going to happen, whether it's, you know, first contact with interstellar intelligence or um, the uh, uh, rescuing of extinct species like the mammoth from extinction and bring them back to life, which I think is easily going to be possible in the next mm. few decades. Um, you know, th- that's why we're in this game. Probably put those species on Mars. I-, I think we'll create like this tourist zoo there where you can go hang out with the mammoth, the brontosaurus. Uh, let's yeah. close. Let's cl- <laughs> <laughs> let let's close with. Um, where we're headed, a lot of, and I don't mean literally, and you do talk about it in the book a little bit, uh, a lot of people feel we've lost our mojo. We've, innovation is, is you know, we wanted flying cars and we got Twitter. Um, I happen to think Twitter is extraordinary. I, there are a lot of negative things about it. I talk about it on here, but when I, when I think about leaving Twitter, which I've thought about and, and may still do, 
what, where would I get my information, my stim, intellectual yeah, it's stimulation? Just, it's the most incredible I, news feed, isn't it? You know, I, I mean, it's well, so much on the ideas than, and the. I, well, yeah. there'd be an alternative would be part of the, part of yeah. the answer. And there are a bunch of them out there trying right now, but um, this view that somehow uh, we live, you know, rate of productivity is very low, productivity growth is low. Uh, standard of livings are stagnant. There's a lot of pessimism uh, in the world that I find um, peculiar. I want your take on that. Are you pessimistic about where we're headed uh, and where we are right now? On the whole, not. I'm still a rational optimist. Um, I spent 10 years going around telling people I've written a book called The Rational Optimist and the world's getting better, not worse. And they would say, but you can't possibly go on thinking that because of the great financial X. crisis, the war in Ukraine, the war in Syria, climate change. Um, climate change, whatever it might be. Every year there would be one reason. This year is the pandemic. So um, uh, I don't believe we've stopped the engine of human improvement uh, at all. But I do just worry a little bit more than I did 10 years ago about the fact that the main engine of the world innovation system is now in China, which was actually quite a free place until recently. Yeah. It wasn't free politically, but it was free economically. If you wanted to start a business, as long as you didn't annoy the Communist Party, you could do pretty well anything. Um, that's no longer the case. That's now run by a pretty monstrous um, dictatorial regime. Uh, something similar has happened in other places. And the West has, to some extent, lost its mojo, and we are going through a cultural revolution that doesn't like reason and um, uh, openness and free markets and free enterprise and free ideas to the same degree. <clears throat> so I could talk myself into a bit of gloom and remind myself what happened to the incredible open uh, discussion of ideas in the early Roman Empire, um, uh, you know, when you could speculate about evolution and the atomic theory of matter and all sorts of things, and then along come the Christians and say, nope, we're burning all those books. I hope that doesn't happen. But, um, you know, you can't guarantee it won't happen. Yeah, there are things to worry about. Um, it's interesting. Most of those things are they're about governance. They're not about the process, the process, if we could let it go, which is what your book's about, if we could leave it alone, um, again, not an anarchist version of leaving alone, but allow permissionless innovation to, to continue, we would solve, I think, many, many problems. But as you point out, yes, uh, I forget who you use as your example, uh, someone coming back, coming back to the present from the past and not coming back, someone coming to the present from the past and being amazed by the devices and technology that would be available to that person would walk into parliament and feel totally at home because it has not changed. <laughs> Daniel Defoe um, is the person. Is it Daniel yeah, Defoe? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Um, that's an incredible thing that, you know, it, it's actually, it's a paradox there. You don't necessarily want government to change. You want it to adjust to deal with the new reality. But you could argue that some of the principles of government that that we've had in the past are timeless and they are what allow yeah. the rest of the world to move into the future and, yeah. uh, and vice versa. If we pick the wrong yeah. principles, we stay mired in the present or the past, head to the past. Absolutely. I think that's exactly right. Cause, um, uh, you know, there's a reason you don't make constitutional change easy, uh, in any country. Um, uh, and, um innovative um ways of making laws would not necessarily be much help um you want to you want to make it difficult to change the law so to some extent i'm pleased if we could well actually it's quite interesting that because as you know i sit in one of the houses of parliament in the house of lords and and we're meeting virtually at the moment um it's going on as we speak. I could could be uh, listening in on my colleagues' speeches. It doesn't work at all well virtually. It's almost impossible to have a reason, reasonable, res anything resembling a debate. Yeah. And as for a vote, well, we all vote without listening to the arguments if we're not careful, <laughs> uh, which is not the point. Um, so um, uh, the innovation of making Parliament an online thing that we've experienced this year 
has been, I would argue, pretty disastrous. We need to get back to real uh, frontline, face-to-face -face debate. And, of course, bumping into each other in the corridor and having a drink and doing a deal and all that stuff, because um, that's the way the world works best in, in politics. There are things one could drag into the future, like, um, you know, uh, uh, well, I mean, I already, as I point out, I, I, you know, I sometimes, if I have to make a formal speech in Parliament, I do so reading it off an iPad. You know, that, <laughs> that would horrify the um, you should be uh, using parchment and an ink and, and an and ink exactly. with a, qu Churchill written with a quill. Of that. <laughs> <laughs> My guest today has been Matt Ridley. Uh, Matt, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Russ, I've really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you for having me on. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday. <laughs>